Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this Conservative Party Conference panel event, Connecting Communities with Net Zero. How do we reduce negative impacts for local communities from transitioning to a greener economy? This event is hosted by Bright Blue in partnership with National Grid Electricity System Operator. Patrick Hall, I'm an energy and environment researcher at Bright Blue, and I will be chairing this panel today. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, Bright Blue is an independent think tank and pressure group for liberal conservatism, and we're actually having a major relaunch this autumn, so do keep your eye out for that. Our research focuses on several themes. They range from domestic, social, educational, environmental, and economic policy. We've also launched a new magazine for this party conference, examining the impact of COVID-19 on our family and social lives, and that it includes, it includes an interview with the Treasury Minister, Jesse Norman. You can read this online on our website, brightblue.org.uk. If you're going to tweet well, I, about this event, please use the hashtag, yeah. hashtag, hashtag brightblue uh, and hashtag CPC20, um, so and you can follow us on Twitter. I can't see you. Uh, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, I think Philip might be uh, uh, having his microphone unmuted. But uh, t to carry on. Uh, so to reiterate, if you're going to tweet about this event, please use the hashtag, hashtag bright blue, all one word, lowercase, hashtag CPC20, and follow us. Our Twitter handle is at wearebrightblue, and you can follow National Grid ESO. Their Twitter handle is at ng underscore ESO. You'll be able to ask questions to the panel via Slido, and when we get to the Q&A segment of this panel, I will put the questions to them. To our panelists, we are joined today by Philip Dunn. Philip is chair of the Environmental Audit Committee. He was elected Conservative MP for the Ludlow constituency in Shropshire in 2005. Melanie On is also with us. Melanie is the Deputy Chief Executive of Renewable UK. Previously, she served as Labour MP for Great Grimsby from May 2015 until 2019. Natasha Engel is also with us. Natasha is a partner at Public First. Previously, she was appointed to the government's first commissioner for shale gas to liaise between local communities, regulators, industry and government. She was deputy speaker of the House of Commons and a Labour MP specialising in energy and infrastructure policy. Fintan Sly is also with us. Fintan is a director of the system operator at National Grid. Previously, he was CEO of the Airgrid Group and, of course, myself, who will be chairing the panel. Just going to go over the key questions before we get underway and panelists deliver their opening statements. In this discussion, we're asking, what disruptions can we expect from net zero? What infrastructure changes are needed to decarbonise the economy? What are the best ways to resolve issues with communities and neighbourhoods for disruptions that impact them? How do we avoid a culture of nimbyism? Which examples are useful for finding mutually beneficial solutions to issues arising from the transition to net zero? What opportunities could a UK green recovery have for easing the transition to net zero? And finally, what is the appropriate way to compensate communities for negative impacts from decarbonisation? I'm going to begin by handing over to Melanie for your opening remarks. Melanie. Thank you, Patrick. Um, it's a pleasure to join you this afternoon. And thank you very much to Bright Blue for inviting me along and to National Grid ESO for sponsoring the event today. Um, I've focused on a couple of um, areas, um, really, and the, the things that I think are important to remember. So for the first thing that I'd like to say is that um, public support for renewable energy, including onshore and offshore wind, is incredibly high. Um, so even uh, in areas where we've got lots of development taking place at the moment, uh, perhaps the, the East Coast um, and East Anglia is, uh, is the most relevant. Um, even there, we've got around 85% uh, public support for those offshore wind development projects. And I think that there's um, a number of reasons for that. Partly, it is about a recognition of the need to change, um, that there is an acceptance that using renewable natural resources like wind is far preferable to uh, using more damaging fossil fuels, um, and that a lot of that thought is really supported through greater awareness of climate change and the role that we all play in tackling that. And um, I can speak from my own um, experience in terms of the benefits that the industry can bring to coastal areas. Um, 
and that that is um, new jobs are being created. Uh, new training and apprenticeship opportunities are coming with those as well. Um, so whether it is those apprenticeships uh, in the operations and maintenance side of work or whether it's large scale uh, manufacturing roles, in the case of blade manufacturing in the Isle of Wight or in Hull, it's making a real tangible difference in those communities and that's a really positive impact. And I think we've got around 11,000 directly employed jobs in offshore wind at the moment. There's been 2,000 created even through uh, the period of lockdown, which is quite astonishing. So it just shows the resilience of this sector. Um, and it's anticipated that we'll see around 27,000 direct employed jobs by 2030. And that's in offshore wind alone, um, as long as we get those, uh, the forecasts of, uh, of development rollouts um, going according to plan. So I think those are really positive things to hold on to. Um, with that fast pace of change and that scale of change in terms of the uh, transition from traditional energy sources, it will bring disruptions. And we do see some of the challenges in communities that come with that. So people are starting to see the impact around transition, for example, uh, the transmission, sorry, of the um, offshore to onshore um, energy sources. Um, but the industry is well aware of that and is working uh, with government and other agencies to try and tackle that as well. And I think that the industry is really aware of the potential for challenge uh, from local communities that might feel some of the negative effects of the quick rollout of these projects. And that's why the community engagement activity that they undertake is really so important. And if I look at some of the community um, activity and benefit schemes, um, we've seen companies like SSE investing over six and a half million pounds, um, supporting over two and a half thousand community projects. Um, Vattenfall um, is another company that's investing two and a half million pounds every year into local communities where their projects are being hosted to recognise the potential impact, to discuss the plans in advance and make sure that shows are available in local communities so that people are aware of them. Um, one of the other things I just wanted to say about the um, disruption side of things was about the, um, the jobs and the change in jobs that is, that's coming from those traditional um, industries. So we're looking at huge change in the oil and gas industry at the moment. And I think that we're talking about potentially 27,000 jobs over the next 10 years in offshore wind alone and making sure that appropriate preparations are made so that people who are leaving that sector and want to come into uh, the renewable sector have got every opportunity to be able to do that um, is really important. And that's something that um, we are actively involved in through the government sector deal in ensuring that we have um, those passporting opportunities of training made available. So there's lots of different, um, lots of different elements to it. Um, there were so many uh, great questions actually in the um, in the briefing that it was difficult to just focus on um, uh, 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 on some of the more challenging side of things because I think that really with those challenges there come opportunities and making sure that we've got a responsive industry that is very genuine that is connected to the communities that they are operating in and recognise that they have got some responsibilities in those communities is really important um, and I think that the way that um, members of our UK have been uh, responding through the Covid crisis is one of those uh, ways that we see that there is that genuine connection with the local community so um, there have been companies for example Community Wind Powers um, COVID-19 crisis fund has been supporting families, charities, the NHS, schools and food banks across its wind farm communities. Um, EDF Renewables set aside around £12,000 for groups near Burnfoot Hill Wind Farm. Um, and even in my own uh, community, I know that I was contacted by local companies that wanted to play their part um, in supporting the community effort around COVID-19. So it goes a vast uh, a vast distance beyond um, just the um, physical changes uh, that are uh, that come with the rapid development 
of um, of offshore wind and onshore wind. Um, I'm aware of time, so I will leave it there. Um, but I look forward to getting uh, more questions from the audience today. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Melanie. Uh, Natasha, I'm going to hand over to you. Yeah, great. Thank you, and uh, and yeah, and thanks also, Bright Blue, for the invite, and uh, and Finton and National Good for sponsoring this. Um, I think you know, it's a, it's a fantastically important question about you know how do we ensure that we connect local communities with net zero, um, and uh, and I, I hope this isn't going to sound negative because actually this is supposed to hopefully be a um, a, a very practical contribution because one of the things. Um, we've been doing um, at Public First is we've done an awful lot of um, uh, opinion research around climate change, the environment and net zero. Um, so we did a very large scale piece of work uh, a year ago for the Decarbonised Gas Alliance. Um, and really the purpose was to sort of really gauge people's understanding, the level of understanding that they had around uh, net zero, climate change, carbon emissions. I mean, kind of some really basic stuff um, and to see also how we could implement or how we could kind of shape policies for net zero that were going to be practical and that were going to be acceptable to people. Because I think one of the problems with this whole debate has been that we sort of, because we are all really obsessed with net zero, we assume that everybody else is. And, and to be honest, even though in polling, we get some quite high numbers of people saying that they have heard of net zero, which is, you know, normally in polling, um, people will tell you that they've heard of, um, heard of a lot of things. That is definitely not borne out in focus groups. Um, now, that is changing a little bit. There's more and more people are, have heard of net zero, know what it is. But really, it's still very, very low numbers of people who have heard of it. This is, you know, if, if you go out of out of the sort of the London Westminster bubble, um, that it's it's just really not an issue for people. Um, and I think that that kind of very basic starting point is something that we really need to engage with. Um, and I think what what uh, Melanie was saying is is absolutely right. You know, the, the public support for renewables um, is extremely high, um, but the public understanding and knowledge of where energy comes from, uh, what energy we use and where it comes from, is really worryingly low. And unless we sort of plug that knowledge gap, um, we're really in danger of, of sort of really talking over the heads of people when they're going to be absolutely essential in, in delivering net zero. Um, having said that, I mean, people are really interested, you know, even before, so before COVID and after, um, the environment polls very high in people's list of concerns. Um, but again, I mean, just as sort of a caveat, there's a big difference between what young people understand by the environment and what older people understand by the environment. So younger people um, will cite climate change as a real concern to them, whereas for older people, it's more plastics in the ocean, um, animal welfare, those sort of issues. It's not it's really not climate change. Um, I mean, they do talk about climate change in groups, but it, there's there's definitely a sort of sense that actually we're not all talking about the same things. Um, that there's not really a sort of a shared experience when it comes to net zero and climate change. And that's something that I think we really need to address if 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 this is something that we really want to achieve. Um, and as I said, you know, there is a big difference. We have noticed, especially in focus groups, that there is a really big difference in people. So in the past, people weren't that bothered about the fact that they didn't know where, you know, it, it, quite common in focus groups, you ask people, where does electricity come from? And they say, you know, as a joke, but, you know, they say it comes from the plug. And that's pretty much their sort of their level of understanding of where electricity comes from. But the difference is that in the past, so even a year ago, the deal was that they pay their bills and they don't have to worry too much about where electricity comes from. Whereas now they're really, really interested. They want to know where their energy comes from. Um, and that is all part of that sort of increased uh, interest in the environment and climate change and the energy that we use. So I think there is a real opportunity to start talking to people about this. And then the other thing that is, I think, a real opportunity is that lockdown has shown us that when people are persuaded that something is necessary, that they are prepared to take really very drastic actions. Um, that's something that we hadn't seen last year, but is something that is definitely true now. But the reverse is also true, which is that as people become less and less persuaded 
um, of of you know uh, of the of the sort of of the different measures that are being taken for um, you know to combat the pandemic. Um, the less people are sort of actually being so compliant as they were, let's say, in March during the lockdown. So I think we have to be really careful about making sure that we really do present facts and figures to people that they believe in so that they do feel that this is a necessary thing for them to do. So I know this is kind of taking a couple of steps back from how do we sort of... Um, you know, stop the the sort of the disruptions that people are going to be expected to take, because actually I think we're still at first base in terms of persuading people that those that these actions are necessary to take. And one of the really big problems, and this is something that you know, back to what Melanie said, at the moment people's understanding of what green energy is um, is wind and solar. Uh, they, they they don't really have any sort of concept of anything other than that. Uh, and again, this is something that came up very strongly in the recent bl um, bright blue report, going greener um, in the polling that they that 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 uh, that bright blue did was that actually people hadn't really heard of hydrogen boilers, of hybrid boilers, of of hybrid boilers. Um, of sort of, you know, um, district heating systems. I mean, these sort of as alternatives and even electric heat pumps is not something that people are very familiar with. So, and if we're asking people really to take some quite drastic measures in terms of home heating, which is going to be absolutely essential if we are going to meet net zero, um, you know, we're basically saying 85% of households at the moment heat heat their homes with gas boilers. Um, what are those? What are the alternatives? And who's going to pay? Well, you know, every single time that comes back to it's either grant funding to help people replace their boilers, which is the taxpayer, or it's higher energy bills, which is the consumer, um, all of which boils down to the voter that unless we have persuaded voters that this is something that is really necessary to do, they either won't do it um, or they'll vote for somebody who doesn't force them to do it. So I think that conversation really, really needs to be had and it needs to be had now in order that people, you know, who are incredibly cost sensitive, especially sort of in the sort of post pandemic Lots of people are losing their jobs, especially when you go outside London, you know, exactly those constituencies that the Conservative Party is looking to level up. Um, if those people are saying that they can't pay and they won't pay um, for all of these measures because they're not persuaded, then to be honest, we're just not going to be able to meet net zero. So I think, you know, the fact that we're having this debate is fantastically important if that is really what we want to achieve. And we just need to ha start having that conversation right now. So that's all I wanted to say on, on that. And I'm really happy to sort of um, answer any questions, you know, especially in the sort of the more details of the of the polling and the focus group work, um, if anybody's interested in that. But I think it's going to be really essential understanding where people are at today um, and also what kind of messages will kind of move them to where we really want them to be if we want net zero to happen by 2050. Brilliant. Thank you very much for your remarks, Natasha. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Philip. Uh, hi, Patrick, and apologies that I had a technical which stopped me from um, hearing uh, the previous speakers other than the second half of Natasha. So thank you very much for uh, inviting me to join you today. I'm the Chair of the Environmental Audit Committee, and we have been doing uh, some work in relation to, uh, in particular, uh, technologies that can help us achieve net zero and looking at um, uh, greening the recovery. But we've not specifically looked at the uh, energy distribution network, so um, I, I don't speak as an expert on that. But what I, I would say, and I'll speak um, briefly, um, is that we have got, just following up from the remarks that Natasha was making, an enormous job of educating the public about the uh, importance of net zero. I think one of the things that came out of the Climate Assembly, the UK Climate Assembly, which reported uh, last month, which was sponsored by six of the parliamentary select committees, was a growing awareness um, amongst uh, the public that, that, that things need to be done and a, a move towards accepting behavioural change. But there was very little information provided to that group about the cost to the individual of doing so. And I think the point that Natasha has just been making about once it hits people in their pocket, attitudes um, to uh, general statements of goodwill become rather harder nosed. So I'd, I'd like to touch on a couple of, uh, of aspects of uh, net zero and the impact on communities, if I may. I mean, first of all, there is a, a, a dramatic 
need to be able to distribute energy from renewable sources to where it's consumed. Uh, and I see one of the biggest um, challenges to the uh, energy generation community is to use uh, the new forms of distributed generation to get uh, energy and electricity in particular to the places where consumers are going to need to use it to either heat their homes or recharge their vehicles. And at the moment, we have a, uh, from a transport perspective, uh, we have a, a distribution network through um, uh, transportable fuel, um, which would require um, a very significant amount of electricity to be regenerated. I'm reassured by energy generators that it's, it's possible to do that. Uh, but uh, I have yet to see, from a, speaking as a constituency MP, with a number of um, energy uh, roadblocks or constraints on the network um, and a number of um, and the people who are looking to, to uh, supply electricity through uh, introducing renewable schemes. I, I have a very large geographic constituency and there's the potential for um, the regeneration and the connection costs to, to get into the uh, distribution network are prohibitive at the moment. So I think there needs to be a sea change in attitude um, uh, or perhaps it's technology. I'm sure Finton can give us a response to that. Um, uh, before we can be generating electricity for, for, at a community level um, uh, around the country, it can then be uh, be used by uh, by the public, which I think will, is an important means of trying to get greater acceptability. Second thing I would say on energy generation is that we have had evidence as a committee that the offshore wind potential is very significant. So at the moment, there's approximately 10 gigawatts of installed capacity in the North Sea. Uh, we have a uh, with both the North Sea and the um, uh, and the Atlantic. We have uh, uh, an almost unique asset in terms of uh, our, our geographic location um, and market leadership, um, uh, engineering skills as a result of the uh, drilling for oil and gas off the uh, off the coast of the UK. That can be harnessed. Um, the industry believe to generate not just the 40 gigawatts that the government is trying to achieve um, over the next 10 years, but 75 gigawatts, there's, uh, there's the, the wind capacity to do that. Getting that onshore, which I'm sure is much of what Fenton will be talking about if he hasn't already, um, is one of the big challenges for public acceptability. And I'm encouraged by the offshore transmission network review, which suggests that some 50% of the um, onshoring of uh, cables from the offshore wind farms uh, can be reduced by integrating these um, uh, different supply uh, networks together so that we have fewer landfall points across the UK. There are two members of my committee who represent uh, constituencies in Norfolk who are particularly exercised about this because there are some, um, you know, some significant community impacts from uh, land falling of offshore wind. Uh, the, the next point I'd like to make briefly is about uh, onshore. So I'm pleased that the government is going to introduce a new pillar for contract, the next round of contracts for difference for onshore wind um, support, uh, which has been obviously uh, uh, removed for the last few years. I think onshore um, has proved uh, controversial amongst the public um, certainly in my area where it's been essentially prevented uh, for recent years. My uh, sense is that attitudes are beginning to change towards onshore, but they're changing very slowly. And to get public acceptance in areas that are not used to, accustomed to having uh, wind turbines, I think is going to take time and require a lot of um, imagination by both uh, people like me trying to in, recognize that this is a, a way forward. Um, but government and, uh, and very importantly, the industry. And certainly along the Welsh borders where I uh, represent, one of the biggest challenges that we had was uh, in getting um, distribution from the wind farms onto the grid and the disruption that that causes to local communities from uh, cables um, uh, making that connection. The last thing I'd just say on um, 
tones and energy efficiency, just picking up the point that was made by Natasha. Um, there is a huge task to be done. There are something like 19 million of the existing 29 million homes in this country that don't meet the energy performance certification standards that the government wants to get to EPCC. Um, and retrofitting 19 million homes uh, is a, t a monumental task to try and achieve that um, by 2050. It means doing a, a million, uh, uh, essentially it's close to a million a year. And the skills um, to do this are simply not there. At the moment, we install in this country about 30,000 heat pumps a year. In France, they install 150,000 heat pumps a year. There are currently over 100,000 um, companies and individual uh, traders who are qualified to install gas boilers. There are only a thousand qualified to install heat pumps. Um, and the current Green Homes uh, grant scheme, which the government has quite rightly uh, introduced and has great uh, potential, has, has a significant challenge in getting it um, uh, taken up, in my view, within the very tight time frame that's been given thus far to uh, next spring, uh, simply because of the capacity of the industry to be able to uh, undertake those installations. I think there are a lot of issues in public acceptability in skills, and that obviously provides the opportunity for green jobs, which uh, is the big counter to uh, public acceptability. If we can secure the kind of jobs ambition that the government has of two million green jobs generated um, from uh, from this transition, then that will be great and will help to ensure that uh, the public go along with it. But it's a big ask. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, I'm going to move now to Fintan, if you could give your opening remarks, please. Super, thanks very much. So, so maybe just a, a quick word about uh, the electricity system operator. We uh, plan, manage and operate the electricity system in real time. So balancing supply and demand uh, and as Natasha said, making sure that uh, the electricity does come out of the plug or that the light does go on when you, when you flick the switch. So uh, managing that balance of supply and demand on a minute by minute, second by second basis, that's uh, what's core to what we do. And over time, what we're trying to do and one of our core ambitions is to transform that operation of the electricity system such that by 2025, just five years away, we'll be able to operate the system uh, at zero carbon. So if we have that renewable energy available, that zero carbon energy available, that we'll be able to maximize the use of that uh, on the grid. We are a legally separate part of the National Grid Group. We have our own board and, we're, and our own governance. And I think with that independence, we can take a whole system perspective right across the energy system, uh, looking for the best answers for UK PLC. And maybe just in terms of minimizing disruption then to, to communities, I think there's sort of three things that we try and do in that space. The first is, as I mentioned, taking that whole system approach uh, right across the energy value chain so that it's not, uh, you don't get discrete overlapping initiatives that you get the right answer overall. The second one is around maximizing the use of the infrastructure that's there uh, so that you don't uh, build new infrastructure unnecessarily and that you uh, get a joined up integrated approach and maximize the use of infrastructure. So, and the third one is around engaging early and listening to, to communities. I was struck with, by what Natasha said around a knowledge gap and that's certainly something uh, we need to address and then need to address that by uh, engaging and listening to what, what communities say. And then maybe just picking up some examples of, of how we see that play out then on a, on a more practical basis. Uh, the first example would be our network options assessment. This is where we look at what is the infrastructure uh, that's needed and what are the, how does the network need to develop in order to meet the needs of society and, and communities. And more and more we're pushing for new technology solutions. So not just building new uh, pipes or wires, actually looking at are, are there new technologies that are available that would minimize uh, that infrastructure that needs to be, built, to be built or provide better answers for, uh, for the system as a whole. And more and more we're seeing those come in as, as technology 
uh, makes more options available to us. The second example I was just going to mention was around just opening up the markets that we have to enable uh, customers to, to participate in them. As we see, uh, and Philip talked about uh, electric vehicles, as we see more and more electric vehicles uh, roll out, uh, we're seeing more and more also opportunities for individuals to participate in uh, markets and provide services back to the grid. So it's not just a one-way transaction, but consumers and businesses can uh, participate in and provide services back to the grid. And we're seeing that happen with uh, domestic consumers now providing core uh, frequency and stability services back to the grid, which, which is really, really great to see. And the third example I was going to just talk a little bit around is around offshore coordination. And uh, this picks up a little bit on what Melanie spoke about earlier around uh, the scale of offshore ambition that's out there. And, and Philip talked about the 75 gigawatts by 2050. Well, earlier uh, this week, we launched a new report which looked at how could you best connect uh, all of that wind uh, back to, to, to the onshore network. Uh, and what we found was that if we can transform the way we think about it from currently, it's a, it's a radial system, each developer uh, builds their own connection back. But if we could actually have a more integrated joined up approach, this would deliver significant benefits to UK PLC, to consumers and to local communities. And specifically what that means is we saw that it would deliver savings of about six billion pounds uh, by 2050. So that would flow through to, to cheaper electricity uh, for consumers. And it would also mean less infrastructure being built. Uh, so up to 50% less uh, cables or stations being needed in using this more integrated uh, joined up approach. And I think that's the type of thing that we need to uh, to progress, looking at more integrated joined up approaches where we can uh, roll out a much better solution that works not only for developers such that we can enable the harnessing of all of that great resource that's out there, but do it in a way that minimizes the impact with communities uh, and also delivers it at the best value uh, possible. So they were just some examples that I just wanted to, to highlight very briefly. Uh, I'm happy to take any uh, questions uh, when we come uh, to it, Andrew. Thank you very much, Fintan. Um, and thank you all for your opening remarks. Whilst you've been speaking, we have had uh, quite a few questions coming in. We have a question here from Evie Hewitt. Uh, this is directed to you, Melanie. It asks, Melanie mentioned that offshore wind will lead to 27,000 jobs. How certain is that prediction? Uh, thank you for, for that question. It's always nice to know that there are people out there watching us. Um, so this, the projections are based on the government's requirements in terms of um, achieving 40 gigawatts and the um, assumptions that have been made uh, on the kind of developments and the rollout of those developments. So it is impossible to say it is definitely going to be that figure, but that's about direct employed in the offshore wind sector. Um, and if we look at the move towards renewables, and we've heard a whole host of different technologies, so whether it's hydrogen, uh, whether it's wave and tidal, um, uh, whether it's about infrastructure for electric vehicles, there's a whole range of different jobs that will come through uh, greening the economy uh, in a much more fundamental way. So I've firmly got my fingers crossed that, uh, that 27,000 is a minimal figure. Thank you, Melanie. Um, we've got another question here from Harry Polworth asks, how are you going to get communities to care about net zero when so many will be struggling with the economic fallout of the pandemic? I think maybe Natasha, I might go to you for this question first and then any of the others feel free to chime in. Could you just repeat that, Patrick? Sure. It says, how are you going to get communities to care about net zero when so many will be struggling with the economic fallout of the pandemic? Um, I, I think that's the really that's the really key question. And it's and I think one of the problems is that at the moment, 
there's quite a few sort of, you know, it, we are talking amongst ourselves, policymakers and sort of um, energy experts are talking about the technical difficulties. You know, what, what Philip was talking about kind of, you know, we're, we're looking at what technologies um, can make this a more possible uh, for us to reach net zero when actually what we should be talking about is how can we make sure that we take people with us? How, how can we really start having that conversation about why it is so important that we meet net zero and about climate change and what we all mean by climate change? Because, you know, as I said, it's not, it's, it doesn't mean the same thing to, to every single person. Um, I think that really, that as Melanie was saying, there is, there is a real shift in public opinion. People really do want to do something. They really do care about the environment and they really do want to kind of participate in in saving the planet. They really do want to do that. And they also know that recycling an extra bottle of wine every night isn't gonna do it. So actually having that conversation with them about how do they change their household heating? That is the really biggest thing. You know, we've got um, definitely electric vehicles are going to be really important, charging points, all of that. But actually the bit that people have got in their hands, the power to make a real difference, is really looking at how they heat their homes and how they insulate their homes because that's one of the biggest you know one of the biggest carbon emitters um so it's really about persuading people that that the, we're all in the same boat everybody's going to have to do this so it, you know this is why lockdown worked really well was because everybody felt that everybody was in it together so we've got to have that sense that everybody's going to be doing this but also saying to them to do it in a manageable way. It's not going to be every single gas boiler is going to be ripped out and replaced by an electric um, heat pump over the next five years. This is saying to them, you know, uh, these are grants that are available. This is how you can do it. These are the different options, hydrogen boilers, hybrid boilers, electric heat pumps, you know, depending on where you are, what your house is like, um, so that we don't have this sort of massive sort of either public bill or private bill um, that people are going to be hit with where it just becomes unmanageable and unfeasible, especially post-COVID. But you know, the key point is going to be people will have to be persuaded that there is an urgency about this, that this must happen and why it must happen. And that's really down to us to stop having that technical conversation and actually really start having that much more basic conversation with, with the electorate, I think. Thank you, Natasha. Yeah, I, uh, Certainly, Philip, go ahead. Thanks. Well, I think we've got a unique opportunity to raise awareness as a result of hosting a COP26 next November in Glasgow. Uh, and with the presidency of the G7 next year, the uh, Prime Minister has made it very clear that this is, his, is one of his major um, uh, ambitions for next year is to make COP26 work and put the UK you know, at the forefront of a delivery towards net zero. So there's going to be a lot more noise from, uh, from senior politicians across government about the importance of this, um, and, and that will raise awareness and the second thing the government will, will be doing, I hope through the spending review, had that happened this autumn, would, would be to putting in place for the rest of this parliament the kinds of measures that Natasha was touching on to stimulate behaviour through some, uh, some support. So the Green Homes Grant is a, is a significant start, £2 billion um, towards uh, a conversion of people's homes. But, but it also will apply to other things that people the choices that people are going to make over the next few years, how they get around. So most of the auto manufacturers have now got it. There is an enormous drive, uh, uh, that's not the wrong word, to uh, away from reliance on the internal combustion engine. We're going to see more uh, models of electric vehicles. We are going to see other sources of uh, alternative fuel vehicles, perhaps including hydrogen, uh, being offered by the motor manufacturers. And most people, when they come to change their vehicle, are now going to start considering whether they don't go, it's not the straight choice between petrol and diesel any longer. Um, so you know, there are going to be things that happen in the next few years which where people will have to start making choices. And if there is some uh, some government support through a scrappage scheme for vehicles or uh, uh, a support package as there is at the moment for electricity, uh, electric powered vehicles, that has an impact on behaviour. I think we will we will start to see those sort of snowballs of public opinion shifting. I think, um, uh, Andrew, if I might add, uh, I think 
just building on what, what Natasha and Phil said, there, there's a bit for me around talking to people in, in terms that they understand and meeting them where, where they are. Uh, and if you like making the, the right choices, also the easy choices for people as well. I mean, there is an opportunity as we come out of uh, COVID and, and start to rebuild the economy about where the choices we make about where we put investment and how we bring people with us. Uh, and I think there's a huge opportunity here because instinctively, I think people want to do the right thing on this. People do believe that climate change should be tackled. Uh, and I think we need to move it away from being a an industry discussion with, with lots of technical terms and, and all of that to, to a discussion that people can buy into and understand what are the steps that, that they can take and, and make it easy for them to make those choices and decisions. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with more. I was just writing down, make things as easy as possible for people. When it comes to net zero, I think it's a little bit uh, like Natasha was saying earlier, people don't uh, know where their electricity comes from, but do they really need to know where their electricity comes from? Um, I suppose there is something about, you know, people being a bit more aware of those things, by and large, as long as things still keep working and they're able to keep functioning um, as simply as possible for them, then that's really what people are looking for. So having an easy phase in of positive things and a gentle phase out of the negative things is probably the, uh, the most straightforward way for people to have the change, but without feeling like it's being thrust upon them in an unwelcome way and having government deal with those big challenges um, and, and have a, a clear process of communication uh, is probably the, uh, the best way to go through um, some of these changes that are going to happen. Thank you all for your responses. We've got some more questions coming in here as well. Um, Sunal Noble asks, the UK led the way with original research into wind turbines are we still a world leader in green tech? Why not use former northern shipyards to manufacture turbines? Melanie, I might go to you to start with on this question, and then if anybody else wants to answer as well, feel free to do so. Um, I, can't, I can't go, I can't even explain why we're not manufacturing those turbines, apart from, I suppose the answer is that um, we were early adopters, um, there was um, a, a brief shift in policy and in that shift of policy period, we saw the global explosion around manufacture of turbines. Um, there is renewed interest now in re-establishing a manufacturing base in the UK and looking at some of our natural um, kind of infrastructure and manufacturing skill bases. Um, and we are actively, the industry is actively in communication with a really responsive government, I have to say. Uh, people might be surprised to hear me say that, but it is a responsive government that is um, listening and is keen to make those uh, changes around the supply chain so that we can see growth um, in our manufacturing base. Um, we haven't talked a lot about the supply chain. I suppose the first question when it came to jobs um, ties into some of that supply chain. You know, how do communities feel the benefit? How can we exploit those natural skills and talents that we've got around the country? Um, and um, some of the infrastructure things that we haven't touched on, um, we can really see um, huge amounts of growth um, when it comes to um, uh, manufacture, um, whether it's cables, whether it's monopiles, um, or all of the other kind of elements of, uh, of wind turbine structures, um, if we get investment in ports, for example, so we get them ready for the next generation of increased size wind turbines. So. A lot of what we need to do now is kind of investing for the changes that are going to come in the next five or ten years as we see the uh, the technology really develop very quickly. Could I just add something to that, Patrick? I mean, the, the question was, are we still a leader in green tech, wasn't it? Um, I mean, Correct, yeah. Uh, and I know, I know the focus was on wind turbines and wind turbine manufacture, but actually I think one of the really key things for me is that we need to really widen out in our discussion how we define green. And I think green should be anything that doesn't emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And if that's the case, then at that point you start including 
hydrogen, biomethane, carbon capture and storage, all of these sort of different technologies. And in, in those, you know, we really have got an opportunity to be kind of real world leaders again. Um, and I think once you sort of widen out that definition of what is green, you then have, you know, you, you increase the amount of um, non or, you know, low carbon, zero carbon energy sources um, that people can use either, you know, whether it's for transport, for industry, for household heating, whatever. Um, and, you know, that way you're going to get to net, net zero much more easily, much more quickly than if we just keep it as this very narrow conversation. And I think that's the problem is that, you know, for most people, um, you know, like I said before, for most people, green energy is wind and solar. You know, it doesn't even include biomass. <laughs> so I, th I think I think really, you know, if we're going to have that sort of filling that knowledge gap that Finton was talking about, it needs also to include all the different texts that, are you know that are perfectly possible right now and that are low and zero carbon and and nuclear as well actually which we haven't mentioned yet and we do actually think, sorry melanie you go ahead i was just i was going to say uh, the i think the thing is that we see offshore in particularly the growth of that over the last five ten years has been has been huge and some of these other um, technologies are just starting to emerge. And I suppose that's really where we start to say, is it a tech leader around hydrogen? Well, yes, we can say that. But does it is it um, established in the same way? No, it's not. And I suppose it for me, it shows the rapidity and development around some of the new energies that are coming through. Um, and probably, I don't know, maybe in 10 years time, we're not going to be talking about turbines in the same way that we are now. Natasha, you sorry, mentioned, um, sorry, Philip, you go ahead. Just very briefly on, on green jobs. I think we shouldn't just be thinking in terms of um, uh, of the energy sector itself in generating green jobs. Uh, we've, we've recently had this commitment from the 200 largest companies in the UK, or 200 of the largest companies, uh, that they want to achieve net zero uh, by their own uh, date, some of the 2040, some of the 2050. Uh, there is a wall of private sector money wanting to invest in greening the, the economy, and that will generate jobs right across the spectrum. Um, so picking up Natasha's point, this is not just about people working, uh, transitioning from the oil and gas sector into the wind turbine sector, as important as that will be. It's, it's right across the economy. Great, thank you, Philip. Um, we had a question here, which speaks to your point that you briefly raised at the end there, Natasha, around nuclear, from Councillor Adam Kent. He asks, does the panel agree that nuclear is the only real solution to reaching net zero? So I suppose I'll put that to all of you, and perhaps I'll start with Finton. Um, I think nuclear, certainly uh, in the UK, is, is part of the answer. Uh, I think as we look forward, you know, we can see that it, it is a core part of the base load generation that, and it, it is part of the solution but you also need to look at uh, other parts of the solution so we've talked a good bit about offshore wind and you know 70 to 80 gigawatts of offshore wind by by 2050 but we also need uh, hydrogen and potentially carbon uh, ccus as well uh, to come along so i think from my perspective nuclear is is part of the solution uh, but it's not a silver bullet uh, that sort of gets you there on its own Sure. Philip, did you have any thoughts around that? I used to be uh, a minister in, in the Department in the Ministry of Defence and had some responsibility for the nuclear procurement and the uh, importance of maintaining a civil nuclear programme and building on the skills is of strategic significance for the UK across much of what we do. So ensuring that, that we don't go from this sort of cliff edge of having no domestic capacity to then requiring significant is really important. So I think we do need to be um, steadily building up the capacity to replace the existing nuclear fleet as they come off stream. Um, and I'd like to see the government actually step up and take some decisions. That, um, that be, so Sizewell is the next one. We need to get a decision on that soon. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think I think you know sort of Finton touched on this. I, you know, it really it's going to it's going to need everything, and and I think sort of um, 
you know, putting all your eggs in one basket is probably not the way to do it. Um, I mean, obviously, nuclear and kind of replacing um, the nuclear capacity that we have now is going to be enormously expensive. But, um, you know, we've also got to we've got to think about, you know, what is the cost of 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 not doing it? You know, because I mean, it is a very reliable, um, you know, um, yeah, non-intermittent source of zero carbon electricity. I mean, you know, it, it is very good. I also think the whole kind of development of um, small modular reactors is really exciting. Um, and again, you know, this is something where, where the UK can can really take uh, some leadership. Um, again, you know, the, 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 not just the cost implications, but also the, the job implications. It's, it, it, this is all really exciting stuff, but we just shouldn't rule anything out. You know, at this point, we, we need to just sort of really rule everything in. And nuclear is definitely part of that. Thanks, Melanie. And uh, sorry, Natasha. Melanie, did you have any thoughts around that? Um, I, I, I'm tempted to be really controversial, but I won't <laughs> say I, I really agree with Vinton. It's uh, it, it's all part of uh, a whole package of ensuring that we have got um, supply that we need, and that um, that that we are all kind of pulling in the same direction as it uh, as we as it comes to um, reducing those carbon emissions. Okay, thanks, Melanie, and thanks all for your responses to that question. I've got another one here uh, from uh, an anonymous person that it asks, does the panel think there's a comms problem with green jobs and public acceptability in so much as people don't really know what they are or think they are for them? Um, I might start with you, Natasha, and then we'll go around the panel. So I think you're on mute there, Natasha. Is there a comms problem with um, the way that green jobs are being presented? Is, was that the question? Yeah, the question was, does the panel think there's a comms problem with green jobs and public acceptability? I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think the opposite, actually. I think that the, that the comms on green jobs and renewables has been so fantastically successful that actually people kind of think that, you know, we're nearly there. Um, and, and I think that's one of the really big problems is that, you know, uh, uh, if you look at the overall um, energy consumption last year, um, you know, th this is overall, this isn't just renewable electricity, but if you look at the overall energy consumption, wind and solar are still only 5%. And so the, the, the fact that people think that we're nearly there is in itself a real problem because they think, well, you know, it's only just one little push and, um, uh, and then it's all done they're not really aware that there are personal implications, whether that's cost or disruption or, you know, whatever else. And I think that's something that really needs to be got across. So I think actually that the, the sort of the, the green comm side of, of renewables is, has been almost too successful. Um, and we need to sort of, you know, we need to make people understand that, that there is going to be a price to this. Um, I mean, and the reason is that if we don't do that, if we don't sort of include people in that conversation, that, you know, if at some point further down the line, they kind of feel that the wool's been pulled over their eyes um, or that it's a cost that they, that they can't bear, um, you know, they're going to be very unhappy about it. And I think, you know, like Philip said, there is this massive opportunity right now, you know, post-COVID um, and also, you know, greater awareness of climate change. I think there's a really massive opportunity to have that engagement with people now, but we really do need to start talking to them. Thanks very much, Natasha. Um, I'm really sorry, but I'm just mindful of time and we've only got a minute left. So unfortunately, we are going to have to actually wrap things up. We did have a, a lot more questions to, um, to get through. So... Um, been a really interesting discussion. Thank you all very much for uh, coming and speaking on the panel today, and thank you to our audience as well. A big thank you to National Grid Electricity System Operator for partnering with us and helping to organize this fringe event. Uh, if you want to sign up to become a member of Bright Blue, you can do so on our website. Uh, we are running 15 fringe events throughout this party conference, uh, which will take place in the designated bright blue space. The next event coming up today that we are hosting is with Offtech, discussing the future of heating, making heating cheaper and greener. That's going to be at 3.30, so please do join us for that. Thank you very much, everyone. Cheers. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.